Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 17. And this is what it says. On that day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. And great multitudes gathered around him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole multitude was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and devoured them. And others fell upon rocky places where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell among the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has to him shall more be given, and he shall have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, You shall keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing and will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear, and have closed their eyes, and lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn again, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Pray with me. Lord, among the words, grant us grace. Grant us grace enough to hear you, Jesus, the Word. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. My wife is an elementary school music teacher. That's significant because by the end of a week, she has seen just about every child in the school. Over 800 students every week she sees. And because she sees over 800 children every week, she's got some really great stories. <laughs> At night, when we're debriefing from the day and, and listening, talking to each other about how our day went, she has some great stories. One of those stories a little while back she told was about a a little girl, a first grader. Now, because Gina knows every kid in the school, she's often the ones that when the one that when when kids are 
are, are need help, that she's one of the ones that, that they, they're first to go to. And here's a first grader. She has a kindergartner in tow. And the kindergartner is just crying and crying and crying. And the first grader went to Gina and said, Ms. Davis, she has something to tell you. Well, the little girl was crying and crying. And <laughs> amid the tears, she said, my class, I, I can't find where my class is. Well, what Gina heard was, I can't find my glasses. So she asked the obvious question, what color are they? And the little girl, the tears stopped immediately, and she said, well, they're all different colors, but they're all my friends. <laughs> well, she was able to help the little girl find her class, but her glasses were never missing. And I tell the story to say there's some distance between what's said and what, what's heard. That's just a part of, of the way things are. And I want that to sink in just a little bit as you realize I'm, I make my living speaking. And one of the most frightening things that I hear again and again and again is people come to me and say, I remember when you said, and that's when I began to tremble. Because very often they repeat things that I'm very certain I never said, and <laughs> nor would I ever say. But somehow people remember that they, they came out of my mouth. And there's a distance between what is said and what people hear. There's a distance there. This morning, Jesus is telling a story about a, a, a sower who went to sow some seed. Went to sow it on the road, went to sow it in the shallow soil, in the thorny soil, and in the good soil. We hear the story and we go, ah, oh, we understand that, heard it a million times, know exactly how this one goes. Hard soil, everybody knows who the hard soil is. That would be the people who hate puppies and just can't stand kittens. You know hard soil people, the sun's always too bright and the sky's always too blue. Things are just too, hard soil people, we just... It, hard to get we we know hard soil and of course it talks about the shallow soil we know shallow soil people shallow soil people are the ones that any idea that can't fit on a bumper sticker it's just too deep for them you know we I know shallow soil people you know shallow soil people well we understood that didn't we when Jesus said it and then there are the thorny soil people you know, they're the people that, yeah, they'll start off and everything looks, looks joyful and they'll, they'll have a heart full of joy, but, you know, they're just up and down. You never do know what to expect. And they're going to let the worries of the world choke out that joy in a heartbeat. And then there's the good soil people. Well, of course, that would be you and me. The good soil people. Jesus speaks and, oh, just an abundance of a crop grows up, and, and it's a bumper crop. Every time we hear the word of Jesus, we just get better and better and sweeter and sweeter. Well, I guess that's the sermon and not much more to say today. Except that's not where Jesus ends the story. He ends the story with he who has ears. It's about the ears. He who has ears, let him hear. And then after he says, he who has ears, let him hear, he tells, now the story takes six verses, but Jesus uses seven more verses to talk about hearing and seeing and perceiving with the heart. And he brings in the big guns. He, he begins to quote Isaiah. Now you start quoting the Old Testament, you start quoting Isaiah, then you know he's serious about something. And he's not talking about farming method when he, he quotes Isaiah. He's talking about the ears. He's talking about the eyes. He's talking about perceiving. Well, maybe there's a distance between what we tend to hear in this story and what Jesus is really saying. Maybe there's this distance. And I first got this idea from a conversation I had with a foreign exchange student a little while back. She had spent a year in the United States. She was looking forward to going home. Everybody loves home. And she had enjoyed her time in the United States very much, but she was looking forward to going home, and I struck up a conversation with her. And 
I said, well, what was the one thing that surprised you the most living here in America? Well, she responded that fast. She said, Americans play with their food. <laughs> well, I was, a real, I was a little bit surprised by it. I, I said, what? She said, oh, yeah, they throw pies at each other. And it's on TV all the time. They have food-eating contests. Not only that, they have egg tosses to see how far you, you can throw food. There are even food fights. Americans play with their food. I was a little surprised, but, you know, I think she was probably right. But she went on to say, she said, in my country, that would never happen because food is too dear. It's too valuable. She said, when I was in high school, I, I began to see all the things that the students would, would throw away. That would never happen in my country because food is too scarce. Well, I think maybe the reason we hear this, this parable one way is because we live in a, not just in abundance, we live in superabundance. We live where there's plenty to throw away. We live where there's plenty to play with. We live where there's plenty to, to, to play fight with. But that's not the culture where Jesus lived. In the time Jesus lived, seed, seed. You, di you didn't just look in the seed catalog and order and it came two days later on Amazon. No, if you wanted seed for this year's planting, you had to prepare that seed the year before. And I began to read a little bit about this and I discovered that, that you, if you wanted to eat a fruit or a vegetable, chances were pretty good you wouldn't be able to use that seed for planting the next year. That most of the time you had to have a, a certain section set aside just for growing the best fruits, the best vegetables, the best grains in order to plant them the next year. And that they had to get to full maturity and, and some fruits and vegetables had to get past maturity to, to fermenting or the seed wouldn't be ready for planting the next year. And then you couldn't just store it away. Then you had to make sure that it was dried in order to store it over time. And then once you began to store it, you had to watch out for mice, rabbits, deer, birds, squirrels, anything that might steal the seed from you. Seed was incredibly valuable. And the story where... A farmer starts off planting on the road, on the hard soil, would have made them start giggling immediately. And that he moves from the hard soil to the shallow soil, well then they would have begun chuckling out loud. And then seed, seed enough, an abundance of seed to be able to throw under thorns? Well, even if it grew, you couldn't, you couldn't harvest it because the thorns are there. And then he plants it last where he expects the crop to grow. Well, by the end of this, people would have been giggling at the humor of Jesus. Any farmer who would do that. And then they would begin to, to tell the story to one another. They'd begin to share the story. But Jesus ends it with he who has ears. Ears. It's about the ears. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then he goes on to say that this is a story not about farming technique. It's not a story about, well, I hope they heard those, I hope those hard soil people heard that. No, it's a story about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. That that's the reason Jesus came, to usher in a, a new creation, a new kingdom, to usher in a a new beginning, a, a new birth. The, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is, is Jesus' number one favorite sermon topic. That he talked about that far more than he talked about anything else. That all of history pivots, it changes at the coming of Jesus because he came to usher in the kingdom of God where God's presence, His power, His Spirit is poured out. And He ushered it in through the cross. 
where he offered forgiveness for you and me. He ushered it in through the resurrection where he lives his life through you and through me. He ushers it in through the pouring out of his Holy Spirit that in Acts chapter 2, it tells us that, that in verse 1, that they were all gathered together in one place where they heard a noise like a violent rushing wind. Well, that's not insignificant that they, they heard a noise, especially if we're talking about ears here. They, they heard a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it says, and tongues like fire came and rested on them, and each one heard them speaking in their own language. That when the Spirit comes, hearing changes. Folks have gotten focused on the, the speaking, but that's not what it, it says right here. It says that the, the, the hearing changes. And that's when Peter, in Acts chapter 2, begins to speak. And he preaches a sermon from the Scripture. It's the prophet Joel. And Joel points to this time, this time called Pentecost, that after Christ is crucified, after Christ is risen, that he says, wait until you're clothed with power from on high. And, 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 and Peter's telling about this time where the power, the power of the risen Christ, his spirit is poured out, and it's poured out on sons and daughters. That it's poured out on young and old. That it's poured out on slave and free. That it's poured out in unlikely places. Hard soil, shallow soil, thorny soil, places that you would never expect. I mean, why would you waste a good spirit on sons and daughters? Daughters don't have any inheritance that they can pass along power. Why would you pour out good spirit on young and old? The old need to be led around. Why would you pass out good spirit on slaves? They have no power at all. They have no prestige. They can't carry with them the seed of the kingdom. But guess what? That's where God pours His Spirit. Well, once you go from son to daughters to young and old, slave and free, you've got it all covered. Covered in the Spirit of God. Even those places that, that you or I might not ever think about, it, God's Spirit. It's been poured there in the not-so-obvious places, in the unlikely places. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about. God pours His Spirit in the unlikely places, the unexpected places, the not-so-obvious places. There's a story about King Edward VII. He had a, a good relationship with his grandson, Prince David, well, the story goes that, that little Prince David was there at, at dinner with his grandfather, the, the king, sitting at the head of the table. And, and Prince David wanted to speak to the king, and he said, Grandpapa, Grandpapa. Well, immediately the, the adults around him began to shush him. He said, that's the king. You don't speak to the king unless you're spoken to. Well... Little, King da little Prince David was about to crawl out of his skin. So he said, Grandpapa. Again, they shushed him. Well, Grandpapa knew he was trying to speak to him. And so after he finished his conversation, he turned to him and he said, Yes, Prince David, is there something you wanted to say? And Prince David said, It's too late now, Grandpapa. There was a caterpillar on your lettuce, but you've eaten him. <laughs> so often it is. Did we think listening? Listening is a secondary exercise. Jesus says it's about the years. Listening. It's about the seeing. It's about the perceiving. Paul Tillich, recognized as one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, said the first act of love is to listen. Not just when we can get something from it, not just when it benefits us, but when it absolutely 
we think that it would never benefit us. That that's where God has, has tucked his spirit. That's where God's presence is. That's where the power of the risen Christ is. And we're to develop ears and eyes to look for it in the not so obvious places. How would your world change if you began to look, to listen with new ears to take the time to listen to a child, maybe a son or a daughter that takes forever to get to their point, but they realize because you give them time that they matter. Or a a husband. How would your life change if, if a husband or a wife if, if you would imagine that, that the power of God's Holy Spirit might actually be in them, would you develop a different set of ears? If, if not only in the son or the daughter, not only the husband or wife, but the father or the mother, that you begin to, to listen or maybe the employee or the employer or maybe the person that looked or thought or acted different from the way that you look, the way that you think. It's about the years. It's about the years and 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 the eyes and the heart that perceives and and his spirit, the spirit of of the risen Christ. It's poured out in some not so obvious places. And Jesus talks about that. The hard soil. The thorny soil. The shallow soil. But he doesn't stop there. He talks about the soil that, well, is expected to grow, the seed. And and that's there's some obvious places. There are obvious places that we we should expect the Spirit of God, the presence of God, the power of God to be poured out. There's some obvious places in the sermon. Eric Ritz tells a story about an English gentleman named Alfie. Alfie had a way of bungling everything. He went through life stumbling and bungling until one day he was in a, a place of, of depression. And he tried to take his own life, but he bungled that as well. While Alfie was in the hospital, a friend came to visit him, and he asked him the question, Alfie, why did you do it? This is what Alfie said. He said, because there's no good news anywhere. There just can't be good news anywhere, because if there was, surely someone would have come running to me to share it with me. The world is full of Alfies, maybe now more than ever that thinks there just can't be any good news anywhere because what's what's most obvious, what's most pressing, what's loudest, what's most shrill is just about all we hear. And it's that there's no good news anywhere. But the purpose of the church is good news, and good news has a name. That name is Jesus Christ. And it's the best news that the world has ever heard. That Jesus Christ came to usher in a kingdom, a new creation, a new beginning, a fresh start, a new birth. Not just for you and for me, but for everyone. And he came to usher this in through the cross. That on the cross... 
Jesus forgave you and me all that's past. Why? Because we need it. Jesus died on the cross to forgive where we are right now because we need it. Jesus came to forgive all that would be because we're going to miss the mark. We're going to blow it. Not just somebody else that we have our our finger pointing at. We're going to miss the mark. We're going to blow it. We're going to fall short. And he offers forgiveness. He pours it out before we accept it, before we've said yes to it. And he rose from the grave in order that he might live his presence, his power, his spirit through, through you and through me. And that even as in that, that, that first Pentecost where they were gathered together in one place, it's the church. It's the church where they're gathered together in one place, listening, listening to grow ears, to, to hear the Spirit of God. It's here that he meets us. The way Jesus put it, he says, where two or more are gathered in my name, I'm in their midst. The way that the apostle Paul put it, he said, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, that it's his Spirit meets us here, that we might grow ears to, to hear not just wonderful, beautiful music that we happen to like, and if we don't, we'll go somewhere else. No, to hear his voice. Where we grow ears to hear the word preached. Not just if it's a message we agree with, but where we'll hear the Spirit. And not just the words of a sermon. The church. The church, we're gathered for one purpose, and that's to point to good news, and his name is Jesus. But nowadays, it seems churches have have gotten distracted, and instead of pointing to Jesus, they've started pointing to each other. They don't feed Christians to lions anymore. They feed them to other Christians. And Christians begin to devour one another rather than pointing to Jesus. He is the good news, and there's a world out there starving, starving to hear that good news about a Savior named Jesus that desires to live his life through you and through me. And it grows up in a love a joy, a peace, a patience, a kindness, a goodness, a gentleness, a faithfulness, and a self-control that won't grow any other way. And Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Today's the day to begin growing some ears to begin growing some ears. This morning, it may be that um, you've been thinking this Christian life was all about the obvious things, being good. And Jesus has become secondary in some place. That you thought it was about being good, Standing on principle. That you thought it was about us and them, or right and wrong. And you haven't heard the voice of Jesus. He's speaking to you now. He's speaking to me now. He's speaking to people gathered now because, well, His Spirit, it bears witness with our spirit. That where two or more are gathered, he's here. That when they're all gathered together in one place, that's where his spirit falls. I want to invite you to join with me in prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, it's not only good news, it's the best news that the world has 
has ever heard that you came to usher in a new kingdom, a new creation, a new beginning, a new birth, right in the middle of the hard soil, right in the middle of the shallow soil, right in the middle of the thorny soil. And you sowed it also in, in the good soil. Give us ears. Ears, Lord. And eyes. That began to, to look and search and seek for you. Where two or more are gathered. Did you give us ears and, and eyes and hearts that seek and pursue you. In, in the obvious places, in prayer, in worship, in the singing, in Scripture the preaching. Lord, did we we begin to to develop ears and and eyes and a heart that that perceives you? Yes, in the obvious places. And yes, Lord, in the not so obvious places. You put folks around us that you've been speaking through for a long, long time. And we've not heard Lord, we come to you this morning asking for forgiveness because what's happened in the past well, we need forgiveness for. And for what we're dealing with today, Lord, grant us power enough to ask for your forgiveness and, and, and we know we're going to blow it in the future. We need your power in the future as well. Grant us grace enough to turn and follow starting this day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, Just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, Thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image. He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.